This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Welcome everyone to Too Good To Be True, and thank you to all the listeners. Are you ready for a really interesting show about some unexplained events? Before we start getting into details, let's just briefly talk about psychic insight and how we apply it. We choose a subject and research it. Based on that research, we determine what we think needs to be explained by creating a series of questions. Then Justina provides psychic insight to answer those questions. At that point, it is a question of individual belief. Now let's go through the disclaimers. Here are the disclaimers. Neither of us claim to have any expertise in any of the subjects that we discuss. We relate information we find through research and the psychic insight. We are always delighted to hear from the listeners. The show only lasts an hour. We don't have the time to present exhaustive research on any topic. This means that there will be information that we miss. We want to provide a basis for the psychic insight. We don't care if a theory turns out too good to be true, as the show name suggests. We are only interested in finding out more of the truth about topics. Spirit can only relate insight that is appropriate for our time in history. Free will cannot be affected. Only comments that are appropriate for our time can be given through the psychic insight. Much of the subject matter in shows will have already been covered again and again in other shows. We want to look into the subjects in a new, different way and be thought-provoking. We are not good with pronouncing names, and we apologize for this. Another disclaimer for this show is that we will be talking about people who are tragically killed. We want to send our condolences to the families and be completely respectful to those involved. Thank you, Justina. You chose the subject of unexplained events. As we go in chronological order, you were kind enough to let me choose the first unexplained event, which is the Mary Celeste. Why did you choose that story? Was it the Marie Celeste or the Mary Celeste for the name of the ship that was found with no one on board? I grew up believing that the ship was the Marie Celeste, not the real ship, the Mary Celeste. I only discovered that the real ship was actually named the Mary Celeste a few days ago. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle wrote a short story about a ship named the Marie Celeste. Conan Doyle, of course, created the famous fictional character Sherlock Holmes. His short story, published in 1884, was based on the real events of the Mary Celeste. Like the fictional Marie Celeste, the Mary Celeste was a ship found abandoned and adrift in the Atlantic Ocean in 1872. I looked into the original story. Besides changing the name of the ship, Conan Doyle changes the name of the captain, crew, and passengers. In the fictional story, the ship is in almost perfect condition when discovered, with warm food still on a table. All the ship's boats were on board, making Conan Doyle's story more mysterious. Let's not forget about the Marie Celeste in Conan Doyle, and let's concentrate on the real story of the Mary Celeste. I found an interesting article on the website, The Classic Case of the Mary Celeste. The article was originally written by Paul Begg and published in the magazine The Unexplained Mysteries of Time and Space. There are many websites on the subject, as well as numerous books. From those sources, clearly the Mary Celeste had an unfortunate history, even before she was discovered abandoned in the Atlantic. The Mary Celeste, a merchant ship, was launched in 1861 in Nova Scotia. She was a 282-ton brigantine, about 33 meters or about 110 feet in length. Without getting too technical, a brigantine was a sailing ship with two masts. At the time, she was called the Amazon, her original name. Soon after the launch, her her first captain fell ill and passed away. Then, on her maiden voyage, she hit a fishing weir off Maine and had to return for repair. A fishing weir is a type of barrier usually at the mouth of a river. While back in dock, she caught fire, 
and another captain was appointed. On the maiden voyage of the Amazon, uh, she collided with a brig in the Straits of Dover, which is the channel between England and France. A brig is also a sailing ship with two masts, but with different sails. The brig sank. The Amazon had to be repaired. A fourth captain was then appointed. This ship seems to be nothing but bad luck, and the bad luck did continue. She was repaired yet again, this time after being pulled off some rocks. She was passed between owners, several of whom apparently went bankrupt. She eventually had United States ownership after being enlarged. She was renamed the Mary Celeste, which is an odd mixture of French and English names. It is almost as if the painter had spelled the name wrong. In the fall of 1872, the Mary Celeste was berthed in New York, ready to take on new cargo and new crew. Captain Briggs was the ship's master and a shareholder in the vessel. He was known as being an intelligent and active shipmaster. The first mate had served with Captain Briggs and was related by marriage. There was nothing to suggest that the officers were inexperienced. Also on board were the captain's wife and their two-year-old daughter. Their seven-year-old son remained at home to attend school. There were a total of ten on board, including the captain's family members. The cargo was 1,701 barrels of denatured alcohol bound for Genoa, Italy. Denatured alcohol is normal alcohol with additions to make it poisonous to drink. At the time, it must have had an industrial use as well as being cheaper. But let's continue with this after the break. Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the Exxon Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the x Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the x Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. President of a new cancer foundation focusing on evidence based physical, mental, and spiritual interventions, including natural cancer cures, prayer, meditation, affirmations, nutrition, and other related holistic cancer prevention and cure modalities. These are used in cancer education, research, and financing care. I ask for your help to continue this important work by donating at www.holisticcancerfoundation.com. Hello, I'm Pete Marsh. With my daughter Justina, we will be presenting the new radio show, Too Good to Be True. If something seems too good to be true, it usually is. But with the help of Justina's amazing gifts, we're going to gain insight into questions that don't yet have complete answers. Have you wondered who built Stonehenge and for what reason? 
Wire crop circles found in the same region as Stonehenge and elsewhere. Are crop circles a hoax or are they created with technologies that we have little knowledge of? Who built the pyramids in Egypt and also in other countries? How and why were they built? Was the Titanic switched with the Britannic as part of a gigantic insurance fraud or for more insidious reasons? What caused the Tunguska event when trees were flattened over an 800 square mile area in Siberia? Will the new insights be too good to be true? Well, that will depend on what you are prepared to believe. Please join us as we start on this journey together. For more information on Too Good To Be True, visit www.xzbn.net. Little children aren't the only ones afraid of the dark. Millions of soldiers return from war zones with PTSD, anger, frustration, fear, and loneliness, much of which surfaces during the darkness of the night. You have the chance to change the lives of these American heroes. Songs and Stories for Soldiers.us provides free MP3 players for these men and women. With a list of 3 million songs in 16 different styles, 100,000 audiobooks, and 30,000 old-time radio programs, every veteran can find something to soothe and comfort them at no cost. All our players contain an 8-hour audio program designed to help veterans fall asleep. With 1,500 plus vets now participating, it's our goal to deliver 10,000 audio players this year. Go to our website at Songs and Stories for Soldiers. Soldiers.us. Help us help a veteran make it through the night. Welcome back to Too Good to Be True. And before the break, we were talking about the Mary Celeste. And I was just talking about the cargo that was 1,701 barrels of denatured alcohol. And I was saying that at the time, it must have had an industrial use as well as being cheaper than the locally produced alcohol. The Atlantic crossing was delayed for two days as the ship was anchored, waiting out storms. On the 7th of November, the ship pulled anchor and set sail. It was the last time anyone saw the people on board. On the 7th of December, around 1 p.m., one of the crew of the ship, the Dea Garcia, Bound for, and I might butcher this name, Gilbrachor. Dad, do you want to? Gibraltar. Yep. Sighted a vessel about eight kilometers or five miles off the port bow. The De Gracia was another brigantine, but with petroleum for cargo. After noticing that the sails were not set correctly and that the ship was listing slightly, the ship's captain offered assistance. These events occurred about 640 kilometers or 400 miles east of the Azores. The Azores are volcanic islands 1,360 kilometers or 850 miles west of mainland Portugal. So this this means that it was about midway between the Azores and Portugal. At 3 p.m., having come within about 370 meters or 400 yards of the mystery ship, the Dea Gracia sent crewmen to investigate, having received no response to their hailing. The Mary Celeste was deserted. There was plenty of fresh water and there were a six-month store of food. The ship was apparently in a far better condition than most vessels at the time crossing the Atlantic. There was evidence that she had recently weathered a storm and the ship had taken on seawater. At the later investigation, the second mate of the Dea Gracia mentioned finding a type of depth gauge on the deck and gave the opinion that the ship was abandoned because it was believed that the ship had been sinking. The ship's temporary log had an entry dated back to the 25th of November. A chart showed that the ship tracked until the 24th of November. These were found on December 7th, about two weeks later. Among items missing from the ship were the chronometer, sextant, navigation book, and a small boat. A piece of the ship's rail had been removed to launch the boat. The passengers and the crew had apparently abandoned ship, taking with them the means of navigation. Also strange was that their last log position was not in the sight of land, not promising for a successful voyage in a small boat. This seems all rather sad. Had they remained on board, they would have survived. The captain must have thought he was in a desperate situation to put his family at risk in a small boat somewhere in the Atlantic. Why don't we go through the theories? The obvious ones were that the captain thought the ship was sinking an abandoned ship or thought that the flammable cargo of denatured alcohol was about to explode. 
The website Skeptoid includes an account of a 2006 experiment at University College London. The conclusion was that a minor flash combustion in the Mary Celeste hold, although probably harmless, could have been taken as a warning that the ship was about to explode. That sounds like a rational explanation. I found ref one reference that suggested that the barrels had been made out of the wrong type of oak. Porous red oak was used and not white oak, which should have been used. That was probably not the first time denatured alcohol had been shipped in bulk, even allowing for more porous barrels. There must be some theories about finding no trace of the 10 unfortunate people, as they obviously had abandoned ship. Why was nothing ever found, although they didn't have the technology we do have today? Why don't you summarize the other theories? One theory came up at the subsequent investigation that the captain of the crew, De Gracia, had conspired to remove the ship's company from the Mary Celeste in order to claim the ship for salvage. In reality, the captain of De Gracia was, too, was reluctant to claim the Mary Celeste for salvage, as it meant spreading his crew too thinly. This theory was thrown out of court. The action of pirates was another theory, but nothing had been stolen. Abduction by extraterrestrials is another theory, but that doesn't fit the missing boat and the missing navigation equipment. Another theory was that ship was hit by a water spout, a kind of tornado at sea. Possibly the captain and crew thought the ship was sinking and abandoned ship. I think that the human factor of individuals reacting to a situation that may have been unique makes the logical explanation very difficult. What eventually happened to the Mary Celeste? The ship ended up being deliberately shipwrecked, shipwrecked as part of an attempted insurance fraud. This was in January of 1885 on the coast of Haiti. The valuable, valuable cargo that had been insured turned out to be a collection of garbage. Of three co-conspirators, one died in poverty and disrepute. Another committed suicide and another went insane. This was an unhappy final chapter for a ship that only seemed to experience misfortune. Let's switch gears now and talk about the second unexplained event, which is Tungusta. Something very big must have exploded, and like the Mary Celeste, I think the story has been largely forgotten. I think I read that it might have been a meteorite, but no impact crater was found. It happened in 1908, so there won't be anyone around who remembers what happened. The BBC website has an article dated the 7th of July 2016 by Melissa Hoganboom. The explosion occurred on the 30th of June 1908 above a forest in Siberia near the Tunguska River. About 80 million trees were flattened by a fireball believed to be 50 to 100 metres or 164 to 328 feet wide. The forest was affected over an area of 2,000 square kilometres or 770 square miles. This was the most powerful explosion of its kind recorded in history. It produced an estimated 185 times more energy than the Hiroshima atomic bomb. Seismic rumbles were even observed 5,400 kilometers or 4,000 miles away in Great Britain. You would have thought that there would have been a massive light loss of life, but Siberia includes remote areas. Were there any eyewitness accounts? Yeah, it was in a remote area, of course. Um, the article I referred to earlier uh, includes the following description. The earth trembled, windows smashed in the nearest town over 60 kilometers or 35 miles away. Residents there even felt heat from the blast and some were blown off their feet. Clearly there was a violent explosion with no official reports of human casualties. It is hard to know if anyone perished. However, a reindeer herder reportedly died after the, the blast blew him into a tree. Apparently, hundreds of reindeer were also killed. What investigations took place? What do the experts have to say? You can't have the equivalent of 185 atomic bombs exploding without questions being asked. Given the size of the blast, there must have been more eyewitness accounts. Wikipedia includes several quotes from newspapers at the time. The following is just one example. This is from the Cyber, which is S-I-B-I-R, newspaper, on the 2nd of July, 1908. On the 17th of June, around 9 a.m. 9 9 in the morning, we observed an unusual natural occurrence. In the North Kerlinski village, the peasants saw to the northwest, rather high above the horizon, some strangely bright, impossible to look at, 
bluish white heavenly body which was which for 10 minutes moved downwards the body appeared as a pipe i.e cylinder the sky was cloudless only a small dark cloud was observed in the general direction of the bright body it was hot and dry as the body neared the ground the bright body seemed to smudge and then turned into a giant billow of black smoke and a loud knocking not thunder was heard as if large stones were f- f- falling or artillery was fired all buildings shook at the same time the cloud began emitting flames of uncertain shapes all villagers were stricken with panic and took to the streets women cried thinking it was the end of the world besides the unfortunate herder and hundreds of reindeer meeting an untimely end life went on as normal there was a 1905 russian revolution that ended in 1907 with political reforms there would have been upheaval at the time 1908 was only six years before the start of World War I and less than a decade before the Russian Revolution that marked the end of the rule of Tsar Nicholas. But let's hear about Leonid Kulik. On April 13, 1927, Leonid Kulik discovered the 2,000 square kilometers or 770 square miles of flattened trees in the form of rotted logs. Kulik was on a mission to salvage iron from the expected remnants of a large meteorite. He searched for a crater, but he couldn't locate one. He did find circular pits that were assumed to be caused by impact fragments. Kulik theorized that an extraterrestrial solid exploded in the atmosphere. This caused the observed explosion and devastation. The swampy ground was too soft to preserve the typical morphology of an impact crater. The extraterrestrial solid fragments were assumed to be buried in the swampy ground. A meteorite is a lump of rock. So what would have had caused it to explode above the ground? Did Kulik try to find eyewitnesses for what had happened decades before? Were there any later investigations or conclusions? Uh, I couldn't find much more information, um, but in 1934, Soviet scientists proposed a variation of Kulik's uh, hypothesis. They suggested it was a comet rather than a meteorite that had caused the devastation. As comets are mainly made of ice, perhaps heating from the interaction from the Earth's atmosphere vaporized the ice, hence few traces would be left behind. That sounds a little far-fetched, a giant water bomb that turns to steam. Wouldn't astronomers have tracked a comet and reported it? Comets are usually a big deal when observed, so I I would agree. A giant water bomb might sound far-fetched, but a nuclear explosion of a possible extraterrestrial origin at a later time between 1945 and 1959 was suggested by a Soviet engineer. But that doesn't explain the eyewitness reports of 1908. Interestingly, the explosion's effect on the trees near the center of the explosion was similar to that of Soviet atmospheric nuclear tests in the 1950s and 1960s. That might be an interesting point, but a nuclear explosion many years later doesn't make sense, given Kulik's findings in the 1920s. Are there other theories? In 1973, in the journal Nature, American physicists proposed that a small black hole collided with Earth, causing some sort of anti, some sort of matter antimatter explosion. That seems to be very out there, but the journal Nature is well respected in the scientific world. Several scientists working together pro- proposed the Vernshots model, named after the author Jules Verne. Fern shots are supercritical magma gas mixtures that violently erupt from underground. Magma is the molten material under the Earth's surface. I will quote from the Forbes website. Areas with a thick crust are composed of hard rocks, magmatic intrusions, and gases tend to build up pressure until the cover is shattered to pieces. Hot gases would escape then into the atmosphere, causing a visible explosion. That seems to be another theory that's hard to believe. Yes, the most ex- accepted explanation is the impact of a natural extraterrestrial object, either a meteorite or a comet. Accounts of several of a series of sounds like artillery shells suggest explosions followed impact. What other theories are there? I'm buying into the meteorite theory, and I'm happy that it landed in the middle of nowhere. The ocean might have been a better place, as long as there weren't any whales or ships in the way. In 2007, Luca... Gasparini and his research team at the University of Bologna proposed that a small lake, Lake Cecco, was, a, was actually the impact crater. Lake, lake Cecco is unusually deep for, for a region with shallow ponds. 
The shallow ponds are formed by surface melting of permafrost. Lake Chekou is, is 700 metres long, 364 metres wide, and about 50 metres deep. We'll have I to think- continue discussing this topic and what happened in the theories after this break. are our personal gateways into infinite wisdom. Don't miss Shamanic Counselor and Indigenously Trained Dream Decoder Sandra Corcoran's inspiring book, Shamanic Awakening Between the Dark and the Daylight. This remarkable work chronicles Sandra's 35 years of experience with diverse wisdom keepers and her initiations throughout the Americas and across the British Isles, Turkey, Greece, and Egypt. Sandy's knowledge of symbology, psychology, and myth influenced her dream blog and workshops. Sandy offers private tarot readings, international journeys, a meditative CD, as well as her book, Shamanic Awakening, to encourage you as you navigate this earthwalk, creating a deeper connection to yourself and all that is. Find this and more at Sandy's website, starwalkervisions.com. This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. How would you like to be able to read other people's minds? Well, the next best thing is here. When you know how to read a person's name, you know how the person thinks, feels, and behaves. Each letter in our name holds a key to unlock our true essence. Our name contains both our gifts and challenges in this lifetime. Nemology science discovers personality secrets hidden in the placement of the letters of our names, including the first and last impression people remember about us. Sharon shows us how to interpret the arrangement of letters as outlined in her book, Know the Name, Know the Person. Sharon Lynn Wyeth created Nemology Science after 18 years of research and testing her theories and has supported thousands of people around the world in understanding themselves and others better. You'll enjoy Sharon's unique teachings as she shares her system to learn the gifts behind your given birth name. Even if you don't like your birth name, there are jewels in this book. If you're thinking of changing your name, ready to name your child, or wanting to get along better with others, this is the book for you. If you'd like to improve your relationships and change your life for the better, get the book today. Know the name, know the person. Or visit www.knowthename.com. That's www.knowthename.com. Hello, I'm Justina Marsh, and with my dad, Pete, we are going to present a new show called Too Good to Be True. Together, we are aiming to discover more truths about this world and beyond. Do you have unanswered questions about the world? Do you ever wonder about aliens, conspiracy theories, or the universe? There are many shows discussing subjects such as pyramids or UFOs, but we want to relay this information based on our own research, including from spiritual means. Hopefully, listeners will be helped with their own beliefs and will appreciate the psychic insights that add to the previous research and information. We both look forward to sharing this insight and beginning this journey with our listeners. Visit xzbn.net for more information about when to listen. Welcome back to Too Good to Be True. 
And before the break, we were talking about Lake Checo and a little bit about this possibly being the impact crater. So, Dad, can you please continue on this? Sure. I was just giving the dimensions. I'll give them in uh, U.S. units now. Lake Checo is um, 2,323 feet long by 1,194 feet wide and about 164 feet deep. Um, There's also no record of Lake Checo existing before 1908, but that might be due to the maps not being complete at the time. If they found part of the meteorite at the bottom of the lake, then this could be case closed. I still think this was a meteorite. I agree, and that the uh, but the massive air blast is is fascinating. Let's move on to the third and final unexplained event for which I've seen a lot of coverage lately. The video of this event is on YouTube and has over three million views. I think the strangest part of this event is that people can actually watch the events unfold. This event is Elisa Lam being found dead in a water tank at the Cecil Hotel in downtown Los Angeles, California. Yeah, I've seen the footage on YouTube, but why don't you explain what happened in the footage and Elisa Lam's background? I will start with some background on Elisa Lam. Elisa Lam, also known by her traditional name of Lam Hoi Yi, she was a Canadian student at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver. She visited California when she planned a West Coast trip, according to her Tumblr page. When arriving at the Cecil Hotel, she originally was supposed to share a room with roommates on the fifth floor. However, she started acting strangely and was moved into her own room after two days. What other information is there on the Cecil Hotel? I remember hearing about it in other stories. The Cecil Hotel does not have the best past. Elizabeth Short, in 1947, who was the victim of the Black Dela murder, was said to have stopped there before her death. Another woman, Golden Osgood, in 1964, was murdered in her room at the Cecil Hotel. Both crimes have never been solved. Also, two serial killers in 1991 and 1985 both lived at the Cecil during their killing sprees. The hotel also has been known for other deaths such as suicides and deaths even in front of the hotel. At least 15 deaths inside the hotel have been documented, with others possibly occurring that were not properly reported. That's a lot of deaths for just one hotel. It seems that after Elisa Lam's death, the hotel got more attention and was researched a lot more than the previous accounts of unfortunate deaths. Yes, it seems that the viral nature of Elisa Lam's death caused a lot of investigation into the hotel. At this time, I just want to say that we have the utmost respect for Elisa Lam and her family. But let's continue with her story at the Cecil Hotel. Elisa Lam kept in constant contact with her parents. On January 31st, 2013, she was supposed to check out of the Cecil Hotel and then continue her journey to Santa Cruz. However, her parents did not hear from her and contacted the Los Angeles police. Her parents also ended up flying to Los Angeles to help search for her. It was reported that hotel staff said they saw her alone on the last day she was seen. A bookstore manager also reported that she saw her and that she was getting gifts for her family. The police continued their search with dogs and searched the room Lamb last used. However, they could not search everywhere with the dogs because they did not have the proper search warrant. What happened next after this? Was there any more signs of Elisa Lamb? The police didn't find any evidence, and a week later, they posted flyers of her and shared her missing person status with the media. On February 14th, two weeks later since she went missing, a video from the elevator in the hotel was released to the public. This video quickly went viral because of her strange behavior in the video. Without watching a video, can you please provide a summary of the video? Yes, I will do my best to describe the video. I would recommend that people watch the video themselves. During the video, Elisa Lam is seen going in and out of the elevator. She also pressed many different floor buttons. The elevator door is open during the whole process. She also seems to be hiding in the elevator from someone outside the elevator and peering into the hallway. She is also seen rubbing her forearms, rocking, looking around, and also backing against the wall. The elevator door eventually closes, and that was the last time she was seen. What did people say about the video? Uh, With so many people watching the video, there must have been a lot of comments and speculation of what had happened before and after the video was taken. Yes, many people had their own theories. 
Some people said that she possibly became possessed by something dark. Other people said she was playing the elevator game, which is a Korean urban legend game. This is a game where a person goes in an elevator with 10 floors or more, rides it alone, and visits different floors in a specific order. It is said that this takes people to an alternate reality. Players are not to trust anyone they see. That's an interesting theory, but it seems kind of far-fetched. What other theories have there been? Uh, We still haven't heard the full story about what had happened to her. I'll get to the final police report soon. Let's continue with specific theories. Some other people have said that she's trying to escape from someone that was following her, and this explains why she acted so strangely in the elevator. Some other people have suggested that she was under the influence of drugs, such as ecstasy. Her family stepped forward and said that she was previously diagnosed with bipolar disorder and was on four medications to treat this. With her background of having bipolar disorder being released, the theory also appeared that she may have had a psychotic episode. Going back to the video, has the video been proven to be true or made up? We discussed previously how it's very hard to know about video and images these days, if they are the originals or have they been changed? There has been speculation that the video has been changed. The timestamp on the video is not clear, and parts have been said to be removed or slowed down. This could have been done for a number of various reasons, but this also could mean that not all of the video footage is the same as the original. Now that we have that background, was Elisa Lam ever found? Did the police discover what had happened to her? There were follow-up events after the video footage was released. The hotel started to have low water pressure in their rooms. Some hotel guests also claimed their water was strange in color and smell. Employees on February 19th went to investigate the water issues. The roof of the hotel had four 1,000-gallon water tanks that were connected to the city supply that provided water to the hotel. We just want to say that the following information is obviously unpleasant. We will just give a a brief overview. The body of Elisa Lam was discovered in one of the water tanks. The tank was drained and the body was removed. Her body went through an autopsy and the cause of death was said to be accidental drowning with bipolar disorder as a significant factor. Her watch and room key were also found with her. There is no evidence of physical trauma to her body. Toxicology tests were performed and metabolics and traces of prescription medicine she took were found. However, there has been controversy around the toxicology and autopsy reports. The story doesn't seem to stop there. How did she get into the water tank? What happened to her between the video and finding her body? How did nobody notice her get onto the roof? Yes, there are many unanswered questions. The doors and stairs to access the hotel's roof are locked. Staff members have passcodes and keys, but if someone tries to force their way to the roof, alarms are supposed to go off. It was said, though, that the fire escape could have provided a way to the roof. It also was said that two of the lids of the water tanks could have possibly been open while she was staying there. However, it's unknown if Elisa Lamb could have gotten into the tank by herself. The tanks are four by eight foot cylinders that are propped up on concrete blocks. There are no ladders to climb on the outside of the tanks, and the heavy lids would be hard to pull once inside the tank. What about her other belongings? Were they found in her room? Most of her belongings were found in her room, but her cell phone was never found. It was said it was possibly stolen around the time of her death. Also, there was a tie to a movie made in 2005 called Dark Water. After Elisa Lamb's death, many people made connections between the movie and her strange death. This movie is an American remake of a Japanese film of the same name. The original story was based on a short story by Koju Suzuki about a mother and daughter moving into a rundown apartment building. In this story, the elevator is not working correctly and the water starts turning strange colors. In the movie, the strange water was traced to a rooftop water tank. In the tank, they find a body of a girl who was reported missing a year before. I think it's time to to ask the questions for the Psychic Insight, starting with the first event, the Mary Celeste. Why did Conan Doyle write the short story about the Marie Celeste? Was it supposed to be to deflect readers from real events? It was supposed to hide some of the underlining meanings and still get the points across without being completely blunt. Was the name the Mary Celeste a painter's mistake? 
No. Was the Amazon, later named the Mary Celeste, so unfortunate with its series of misadventures that included collisions, fire, abandonment, and deliberate destruction? It was chosen to be that way, so as parts of the events unfolding. So what happened to the Mary Celeste was meant to happen? Correct. How can non-living things be associated with bad luck or with good luck? So one, different spirits can sometimes be more attracted to certain objects, which makes them good or bad. Also, some objects suck up the energy of where they have been, and this energy is carried over. Did the captain and crew of the Dea Gratia conspire to claim the Mary Mary Celeste as salvage by getting rid of the passengers and crew? No. Did pirates board the Mary Celeste and take the passengers and crew off the ship? No. Was there a minor explosion of the denatured alcohol that the captain thought was the start of an explosion that would destroy the ship and anyone aboard her? No. Was November the 25th, 1872, the day that the Mary Celeste was abandoned? Correct. Did a water spout or some other natural occurrence convince the captain that the ship was sinking, so he ordered abandoned ship? There was damage to the ship, and that's when people abandoned the ship, so yes. So it was a natural event that caused the abandonment? Correct. What was the natural event? You mean what happened to the boat? Yes. There was damage from the boat from its sailing, so basically it got stuck and hit some rocks. And this caused damage, and then the people bailed overboard. So they thought the ship was going to sink. Correct. Was the denatured... Oh, oh yes, sorry. Was the denatured alcohol stored in barrels made of the wrong type of oak? On a side note, yes, it was, but did not affect the ship. What happened to the passengers and crew after they left the ship? They ended up going and trying to find land. But the problem was that not all of them made it there, and the ones that did, did not get rescued in time. Why was no trace ever found of the small boat with the ten people on board? Because they were searching the wrong spots for the boat, and were actually in the wrong location. So if the search boats went in the right location, some of the survivors may have been able to be saved. So the information got communicated incorrectly so that the people were never found, and the debris was never found. So where did their small boat end up, on the coast of Portugal or somewhere else? So it did eventually sink, so part of it was in the water, and some floated to shore. I think we're coming up to a break. We'll continue the questions after the short intermission. Are you curious? Do you want to learn more about how the world works and have fun at the same time? Study coincidences with me, Dr. Bernie Beitman, MD, on my Connecting with Coincidence radio show here on the XZBN network. Listen to Jungians theorize, statisticians randomize, true believers evangelize, while I categorize. I dance to the rhythm of coincidences. People who experience me see more of them. Maybe something on the show matches a thought in your mind. Let us know. Expand your mind to the weirdness happening around you. Synchronicity spoken here, there, and everywhere. For more information, put Connecting with Coincidence in your search engine and find my website, my social media sites, and my blog. This 
This is the Exxon Broadcast Network, broadcasting worldwide on broadcast affiliates and satellite program providers, including CNN Broadcast Network, Sirius Satellite Network, Star Media, Good News Radio Network, Angel Broadcast Network, Wiki Broadcast Network, and WPBN-TV. For more information on the X-Zone Broadcast Network, visit us at www.xzbn.net. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi, you can still listen to the X-Zone Radio Show with Rob McConnell, The Science of Magic with Gwilda Wiaka, X-1, Dimension X, Space Patrol, and every minute of the Exxon Broadcast Network by calling 213-401-0080, courtesy of Audio Now. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan, and it's free if you have unlimited minutes. Call 213-401-0080 to listen on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Remember, 213-401-0080 for the best of the paranormal, parapsychology, and sci-fi radio programming anywhere, 24-7-365. True healing must address four levels, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, for us to live joyful and productive lives. We tend to treat three of the four, leaving the spiritual languishing. If you're tired of the same dysfunctional patterns cropping up in your life, soul balancing is for you. Trixie Phelps, owner and founder of Soul Balancing, is a naturally gifted energy healer trained in numerous esoteric forms, including shamanism. Trixie has created a powerful modality that safely and effectively clears your energetic field. A soul balancing session can remove interference, heal trauma, and restore your hope. Contact Trixie for a life-changing long-distance session today, www.soulbalancing.world. There's a legend shared by many indigenous cultures of a time when the nations were cast to the four corners of the world. Each nation was given a body of sacred knowledge that held a different portion of the truth to preserve. True reality could not be known until all the nations reunited, combining the information. If a single one was missing, the world could not be reborn and darkness would prevail. The Science of Magic Radio is dedicated to reuniting the sacred knowledge. With the understanding, none of us has all the answers, but together we can open new perceptions and possibilities. Through our combined vision, the world can be reborn into a place where darkness no longer prevails. Join me, Gwilda Wiecka, and the Science of Magic daily on the Exxon Broadcast Network, xzbn.net, or visit us at thescienceofmagic.net. Welcome back to Too Good to Be True. And before the break, we were asking the questions and providing psychic insight about the questions. And we were on the first unexplained event of the Mary Celeste. So, Dad, can you please continue with the questions? Sure. Why did the three of those involved in the insurance fraud that caused the wrecking of the Mary Celeste meet with such miserable ends? Basically, because one, it was written into their life charts, and two, karma was at play. Why didn't the investigation record that the ship had damage that might have occurred by hitting rocks? Because the damage was not very obvious and could have been caused by a number of different things. So at that time, investigators did not correctly identify. And also, it was hard for them since it was such a long time ago. There was not the technology and expertise like there is today. Was it in the life charts of the captain, his family and the crew to have that ending. Yes. I'm now going to move on to the Tunguska event. Uh, Given it would have been difficult to estimate the magnitude of the event at the time, how large was the explosion at Tunguska? It was a very large explosion, so it went on for quite a distance. 
Were there any other human casualties bes beside the unfortunate herder? Yes. How many casualties? There were two others. Were a lot of animals killed? Yes. What were the after effects of the explosion on humans and animals as well as the forest? When there is some type of explosion or energy wave, that energy lingers. So a lot of the animals scattered once the explosion was actually done. So a lot of the animals left the forest, but also obviously the area was damaged and took a while to actually get back to normal. Was it true that the remoteness of the location along with the political upheaval at the time prevented any real investigation? Yes, and it was not on the top of the priority list since people had higher priorities to investigate. Starting at possibly the least plausible explanation first, was the explosion caused by a nuclear device? No. Did a small black hole collide with the Earth to cause the explosion? No. Was the cause of the explosion a comet? So yes, the explosion was caused by something colliding into the Earth. So it was material from space, but it was larger in size. So you could call it a meteorite that was actually on fire after it passed through the atmosphere. And when it collided with the Earth, that's when the large explosion happened. Was Lake Checo created as a meteorite crater? Yes. Is there material from the meteorite at the bottom of Lake Checo? Yes. Why was the explosion extended? According to the newspaper, newspaper articles, sounding like a series of artillery shells. Because there was the initial shock of the meteorite actually hitting and then there's the after effect of the ground actually breaking. So there's the initial hit and then the breakage. So it almost rebounded from the Earth's surface? Correct. Is another event similar to Tunguska likely to occur sometime in the future? Yes. There was the Chely Abinsk meteorite from 2013, which, not, was, which was not as big as, as the Tunguska event. Um, was that event a similar event? Yes. Now we're going to move on and talk about uh, Lisa Lam in the ele elevator. And the first question is, was the video, video footage on YouTube altered? Yes. Were parts of it cut out and what, what was changed about it? There are parts of it that were cut out with another person in the elevator that were cut out to protect their identity. Part of it were cut so the video seemed shorter than it actually was. Did the Cecil Hotel's past affect its future? So the problem is with the hotel is that so many things have occurred there that are very negative. So yes, this negative energy is lingering. But you cannot say this will be a cause for future events since negative energy is there. But of course, we cannot say that the negative energy would cause someone to harm themselves. Why did so many deaths occur in the Cecil Hotel? The first reason is because of its location. So the location is ideal for many people since they were in LA. But a lot of people who go there, go there with expecting one thing and end up with something different. So first, it was location. Second of all, the hotel was cheap for one. And two, it attracted many people who wanted to be isolated because of, you could say, the eerie nature of how the hotel was designed. What was Elisa Lam doing in the footage from the elevator? So the problem is there are multiple things going on with her, which makes it more complicated. So there were issues with her mental health at the time, and she was also being followed by someone. So she had this extreme paranoia, but in a way, she had a reason why she had this paranoia. Was she possessed? No. Was she playing an urban legend game? No. Was she under the influence of drugs besides her prescription drugs? She was on her prescription drugs, yes, but not under the influence of other drugs, no. Was her behavior because of her bipolar disease? She did have issues with her mental health that were triggered, so yes, her mental health was triggered. What was she looking at outside the elevator? The person. Why was she pressing so many buttons? In her mind, she was trying to escape, 
and she thought if she kept pressing the buttons, the elevator would move quicker. How did she get to the roof of the hotel? She did use the fire escape. How did she get inside the water tank? So this is where the story gets more complex. Since when she went up to the roof, basically it was to escape the person who was following. She did get followed. As you know, with psychotic breaks or with issues, they sometimes get extreme strength or extreme abilities. So to get into the water tank, she was one, trying to climb into it and remove the cover. But she did have assistance getting into the tank. So the combination of her trying to hide and she had assistance. Assistance from a person that was trying to harm her? Harm her, yes. Where did her cell phone go? That was stolen. Was it stolen by a random person? No, by the person who was there. So the cell phone had more evidence. So that is why the evidence was destroyed. Did anything else happen? Someone did pull the cover over the water tank. So she had no chance of escaping. What is the relationship between Elisa Lam's story and the movie Dark Water that came before it? So the problem with this is that it was a coincidence, but a very close coincidence. So basically, someone did have this made-up story in their head before Elisa Lam's disappearance, but there's no connection between them making the movie and actually her disappearance. Were any of the employees of the hotel involved? No. This is the final question. Why are so many people so interested in strange deaths such as this one? So the thing is that when deaths occur, people are so interested in the strange ones since people like to fill in the gaps. So they like to come up with different theories for the death. And that's a hard part is some people are very disrespectful about what happened to her and others. So the problem is that people are very curious about the different possibilities just like how people are curious about horror movies and things like that. Okay, I'll have to ask the question. Were the explanations for the Mary Celeste and the Tunguska event too good to be true? That depends on what you are prepared to believe. These explanations are in no way paranormal. Uh, it is fortunate, though, that the meteorite did not land on a town or city. Yeah, I also want to say that Elisa Lam's story is disturbing. But we thought we would want to continue with it because her story deserves to be told. We also want to say again that our condolences are with the families associated with the Mary Celeste, the Tungasta event, and those who lost their lives at the Cecil Hotel. Why don't you talk a little about uh, our uh, new Facebook site, Justina? Yes. So for all the listeners out there, we actually just made um, a Facebook page for all the listeners to come contact us, interact with us. And we're hoping in the future to actually have interactive polls and different um, topics about what you want to hear next or any feedback you have about shows. So you can go into Facebook and you can type in Too Good to Be True and you'll see our pictures there and a little description about our show. And you'll be able to go there and get links to our videos on YouTube and just interact with us. So we would love if you go and like our page and follow us there. And of course, as we always say, we love to hear from the listeners and we would love different suggestions for the future and even discussion about the three different unexplained events we discussed today. Yeah, it'd be nice to have uh, a more, um, I guess, cheerful subject to talk about next time. But however, I think it was important to try and tell the, the uh, these stories from the psychic perspective and uh, give people food for thought. One takeaway for me in particular was that um, um, mental illness um, is is very sad and not really understood. And if Elisa had a broken leg, I think her treatment would have been far different. Yeah, and I also want to say that when we do discuss that the lives that were lost, we always want to be completely respectful to the families. And with the different stories, when we do do the research, we make sure that we find the research that actually has been proven. I mean, we do talk about the theories, but there's a lot of different stories about people that go around and a lot of disrespect. So we always want to make sure we have the utmost respect for the family and anyone involved. And I think also a point we want to make, too, is that 
um, we want this to be interactive. So anyone who wants to come and speak to us, please come to our Facebook page, like it and follow us. And of course, thank you to all the listeners. Yes, thank you all for listening. I really appreciate it.